Your family is your squad. That's how you should think of it. You should think of your kids as your squad. For those of you who don't have kids yet, young women always hear this nonsense that kids are a burden. Kids drag you down. Kids prevent you from doing fun things. There's a little bit of truth to that when they're little, to be honest. I, they're so cute. They're so cute. They're adorable. Obviously, when my kids were babies and toddlers, adorable. We were pulling up videos just last night, in fact. And I thought, oh my God, that is so precious. It's so sweet. <laughs> and it was so hard. Yeah. It was so, you can't sleep. You can't reason with them. They're yelling. They're making noise. They're not sleeping. It's insane. And you can you can still do all sorts of fun stuff with little kids and babies in tow, especially once I and my podcast listeners revolutionize the culture and end all of this anti-woman nonsense where plenty of establishments uh, where you would go as just a normal course of life are pretty anti-baby. You know, you get on a plane and people are like, oh, Oh, that's someone's bringing a baby on a plane. How dare they? Yeah. How dare they do that? It's like what we, us Village Hustle podcast listener people and myself, what we're going to do is change the culture to be like, look, if you're that sensitive to noise and I get it, I am, I understand. I I don't enjoy hearing a screaming baby for two hours. I'm actually on the high end of being sensitive to that sort of thing. The onus is on you to buy some noise-canceling headphones. I just saw some on an Amazon discount for $15. So I don't care how poor you are, you can get noise-canceling headphones. And I have said before that if you if you really want to go to a place where women and their children don't bother you at all, um, I can hook you up with a coffin <laughs> because that's where you can go where there, there's no life, there's no noise, and nobody will get on your nerves at all. Or you could move into a museum. That's another <laughs> place where everything is perfect. Everything's perfect and it's untouched. orderly and untouched, yes. And, and you know what's great about a museum, you'll love this, everything in it is dead. By definition, everything <laughs> in a museum is dead. So there no artifacts. Yet yeah, the mummies aren't crying and making noise and interrupting your thoughts. You'll love it. You guys will love this place. Um, so so yeah, like kids making noise, it, it bothers me as much as it bothers anyone. But I don't look at it like these broads need to stay home. <laughs> they should never leave the house because because they're because they're babies might might interrupt my brilliant thoughts they need to stay home and and it's so anti-woman and that that is how we're going to phrase it that it's so anti-woman because you know who's not dealing with this is the the fathers of these children i'm thinking in particular of some gals i know who are single moms they it was a surprise pregnancy situation and uh the guys took off and so now the moms, they have these little babies. They're raising this child. And now they're dealing with a society that is like, I, I'm on a plane and I didn't think to bring noise cancel- canceling headphones because it didn't occur to me that other human beings might be on this plane. And so now I'm going to give this mom dirty looks because her baby's crying on the plane. And you know what her boyfriend is doing? You know what the baby's father is doing? He's playing video games with his yeah. friends. He's sitting around with his friends and he's smoking weed and he's playing video games. This example is getting very specific. I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna start using names <laughs> at this at point. This point. <laughs> um, it's like, Josh is is over there. He lives on 8th Avenue next to, like there's a Taco Bell right there. And he li- <laughs> like, it's there's some construction if you're trying to get there, but you just go through that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> um, but oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, the father others, especially in single mom situations, they don't have to deal with any of this. So it's an absolutely anti-woman set up that we have in this culture, this this idea that, that women can't bring their babies and, and children into public places. And in churches, uh, man, you're just going to hell if you, I mean, <laughs> God hates you for sure. I know God loves everyone, but he doesn't love people who are like so delicate that that they're like oh I, did, I missed 
I missed one word of the homily because like a baby was making like oh come on we all complain about the homily we you know the homily was boring like I couldn't hear the sacred scriptures <laughs> it's like the same readings all over the world in the same like look it up bring a book Brit like find out what Bible readings were doing there read read it in the book. You don't, you don't need to hear anything. Okay, so now I'm going to go on a tangent about church services, but hit the I just stopped a tangent button. No, I'm, I, welcome new listeners. We're, we're two minutes into this podcast and I'm already on a tangent because the main point of this episode is that um, when people think of children and they pitch having children to young women, they get stuck in the baby phase. They're like, it's so hard. <laughs> Nobody ever talks about what your Thanksgiving dinner table will look like 25 years from now. I find it ironic that we also live in grind set culture where everyone's listening to Alex Hormozy and his viral videos. And they're good, by the way. I have to laugh a little bit at some of his content, <laughs> but they're 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 good you know, with his tree trunk arms. Like he said, that guy is so big. He's just like this massive ball of muscle with a, a little head and a mouth that moves. It's so, it's it's amazing. I mean, good for him. He works out a lot more than I do. Um, so they, they follow guys like this who talk about when you're building your business, you have to sacrifice for three years and, it's, and, it, and you're going to be in startup mode and it's going to be so hard, but then you, you'll make your millions and it's all worth it. And everyone's into that. A mainstream culture likes that idea. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. If I'm if I'm building a business, of course, we'll be in startup mode. We'll be in bootstrap mode, and it will be very hard. And I'll be sleeping on the floor of my office, and that will be my lore. But we're building to this incredible thing. But then that paradigm completely dissolves when it comes to kids. This paradigm that it's a hard couple of years, and then you build to greatness for the rest of your life. It pays dividends for the rest of your life. No, nobody can wrap their minds around the fact that having children is more than the first two years. So they're like, girl, you want to be dealing with the baby that's spitting up on you? Babies spit up for like seven months and then that passes. And it's so funny that we can understand when it comes to business that you shouldn't think about the first few years and you shouldn't make a decision about whether to go into this endeavor based on the first few years of your experience in business we understand that but when it comes to babies and children it's like well a baby not sleeping through the night is hard so you should make sure you never have kids it's like what are you talking? <laughs> why why do people lose their ability to think long term when it comes to children and they they talk to young women this way all the time and it's unfathomably dumb so you know and this is this is exactly why we wonder how this podcast is free because i'm still just in the setup i haven't even started the show this is the setup that is the main topic for today uh we're going to talk about this idea of how we relate to our kids and in particular i am a fan of seeing your kids as your little squad and i am a fan of kind of being friends with your kids and the the most classic conventional parent wisdom is you're not your kid's friends. Don't be friends with your kid. Uh, I I reject that actually. I think I think that made sense a hundred years ago. I think we have inherited a little bit of that wisdom from previous generations, but I don't think it applies anymore. And I'm going to make the case in this podcast episode that as modern parents, we need to wake up and look up, look around and look at how the world has changed and realize that what worked for our great-great-grandparents and our great-grandparents and our grandparents, what worked for them, the parenting philosophies that work for them, need an update. I, I do think, for reasons I'll explain later, it probably didn't make sense to be friends with your kids in 1890, to be buddy-buddy. To be but we don't live in 1890 anymore. So I'm going to make that case. And I have an exciting announcement. Um, this is the last week of this garbage <laughs> podcast studio that both of my YouTube viewers are seeing 
right now it's Ooh, the keep the, saying we shouldn't change by the way <laughs> that oh really is that i haven't been reading the comments because because youtube is a lot of there there's a fair amount of hate on youtube so i don't read the comments because i i like to live in a delusional <laughs> land where it's like no everyone thinks it's great they're saying it's amazing but are they nice are people being nice oh, yeah. on youtube oh not- oh they like this <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's great okay you know what guys i'll start reading Forever the youtube like comments <laughs> if they're okay um no you guys just wait it's gonna be amazing this podcast studio is about to be so next level you are going to be like Jen is broadcasting from 3023 yeah this is a next level podcast studio Caitlin and I are working so hard it's so hard so the the YouTube reveal and the official YouTube launch is next week so enjoy it while it lasts enjoy <laughs> This horrible, <laughs> horrible Doesn't match YouTube. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's like, this is not our color. <laughs> Enjoy this horrible YouTube background for one last week <laughs> because the big studio reveal and we are changing the podcast logo. So the logo changes, the studio changes. It's all going to the next level. Starting next week, it will be even more shocking mm-hmm. that I don't make money on this podcast. I mean, <laughs> you'll, you will just be like, I. there's no way with a podcast – this professional looking, you, you just won't believe it. And so, you know what I have, uh, you know what I've decided to do? I've decided, so Caitlin, you know that I, I currently have a block on the YouTube account where approximately 8.67 uh, trillion people try to watch each episode of this podcast on YouTube. <laughs> yeah. But I called the CEO and I said, let's put a block on it because I don't like the background. So like if you pull up my YouTube, it's like, okay, 120 views per episode. (laughs) Obviously, I have an enormous YouTube following. Um, I'm actually the biggest YouTuber. (laughs) You you wouldn't know from my 6,000 subscribers, but that's because of the block. (laughs) Six million people have tried to subscribe, but I have the block on it. And we'll remove the block after next week. So, I mean, you'll see, I mean, it'll, we're going to be shutting down the platform with the enormous number of views that I will be getting on YouTube um, starting next week. So I'm very excited about that. Caitlin and I have been working so hard to pull this together. So you have that to look forward to. This is, this is the last, pull it up on YouTube so you can enjoy the last (laughs) shot of our terrible temporary background and don't forget that my fall tour starts soon the first few cities i am heading to are new york pittsburgh las vegas dc philly boston and that's through um september we have more dates you can look in the show notes for that oh caitlin did you forget what the website is do you do you just not know what do, do you wish we had a jingle I wish we had a jingle. If only we had yeah, if, somebody to remind us. If only. That would be incredible. If we had... Um, <laughs> it's going to get stuck It'd be incredible in if I could find... The, yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. Last week, we had some issues executing this. But listen, turn, turn your volume all the way up. You are about to hear the best piece of music you have ever heard or... If this audio doesn't work again, <laughs> me screaming and burning down my podcast so studio. Way, it, <laughs> you're about to hear one of the two. Jen Fulweiler is hitting the road on the maternal instinct tour. So watch where she goes. Just go to jfcomedytour.com. Jfcomedytour.com. What, so now, I mean, my ticket sales are about to quadruple with a jingle like that and by the way chicago did sell out some of these cities for sure are going to sell out so go to what is it what is it go go where <clears throat> where do we go to buy tickets i don't know if we only had a jingle Jen Fulweiler is hitting the road on the maternal instinct tour so watch where she goes just go to J- Amazing. Okay. <laughs> JFcomedytour.com. Okay. I'm stuck in my head. <laughs> now, here we are, 15 minutes to. Th- I haven't even introduced <laughs> this show. That was feedback I got when I was at SiriusXM. Um, my boss would always say, You you need to set up the show <laughs> faster than, you know, <laughs> your, your other, your, your, the other hosts on this channel set up their shows like within 45 seconds. 
um, you have been known to go 20, 30, 40 minutes into a show and you haven't even introduced it. My feeling is let's get to the content. When I'm pulling up a new podcast episode, I'm like, you can tell me about this podcast later, but like, I need to know if you suck or not first, you know, Mm -hmm. like, or do you have anything to say to me that I might care about? So, uh, welcome to the Jen Fulweiler Show, coming to you from Austin, Texas. I am your host, Jen Fulweiler. I'm a best-selling author, stand-up comic, and mom of six. This is the podcast where you learn the art of the village hustle. That is being a hot girl, girl boss who knows that love and family and community are the foundation of all true success. Caitlin is our fabulous producer. We publish new episodes every single Wednesday morning, and we just launched a brand new Patreon level. At the basic level, you still get the after party. After each episode, we leave the cameras running, and I talk a little bit more about the topic of the day, share some behind-the-scenes stories. That's the basic level. Next level up is the village hustle level where I share my secrets. I go into detail about my career, problems I'm facing, how I'm solving them, all that kind of thing while I do get ready with me videos. So I might be cooking dinner, doing my makeup. So you're seeing what recipes do I use for my family? What am I cooking? How do I do my makeup? How am I doing that lip liner? That sort of thing while I am sharing village hustle secrets. All of that is in the show notes. You can find that link to our Patreon in the show notes, or you can go to patreon.com slash this is Jen, patreon.com slash this is Jen. And I I read every Apple podcast review personally, and I'll I'll start reading the YouTube comments. Okay. I will start, (laughs) I will, I will begin. Maybe Caitlin can delete the, if there, if if anyone's a hater, (laughs) If they're like, I, your podcast studio is actually the worst, Jen. It is, it is actually the worst. Then maybe Caitlin, can, she can ban, you're banned from my YouTube. That'll be a power play. You don't get banned. to, you know, I hadn't, I was going to have 91 views, but now I only have 90 because I banned that one hater. Okay. Um, here's, before I, the main topic, no, no, actually my lead in topic today, it's, it's, it is connected to this topic of seeing your kids as a squad and kind of being friends with your kids. It brings me so much joy, what I'm about to talk about, that um, I, I just needed to take a moment to collect myself. And while I do, I will say another thing you get when you pull up this podcast on YouTube, just search for Jen Fulweiler, F U L. W I L E R. It's my married name. My maiden name was Bishop. Much easier to spell. Um, search for Jenful Weather podcast. I'm sure it will come. I don't know what to. I don't know what URL to tell you to go to, but I bet it's very easy to find on YouTube. Um, one thing you will see is um, I I I I can't raise my eyebrows again. I said I would stop doing Botox. She lied. I know. And I did. I did. So here's, this is an advantage that you get from Botox, uh, from, I'm sorry, my YouTube. If you look at, let, let's see, I did not have Botox for anything you see on YouTube up until, okay, episode 165 was the last non-Botox episode. So I got Botox, you'll see it starting in episode 166. I did find someone who made it even. For once, I don't have one eye is not noticeably (laughs) droopier (laughs) than the next. I will say, for those of you watching, Caitlin can describe for people listening on audio. Right now, I will try to raise my eyebrows as high as I possibly can. Okay, are you ready? (laughs) Caitlin, describe for the audio people what is happening. I'm I'm seriously trying. Like, I'm really trying. Are they moving at all? I mean, like... Like a millimeter. A millimeter. A millimeter. If that. I, it, if that. <laughs> if that. Um, and okay, now I'm trying to make like a, like a angry, scrunch. Like yeah, a- that angry. I, I'm seriously trying. I, I'm trying to scrunch my brow. Is that like You're doing it now? I, I'm literally doing it right now. I'm, uh, I'm trying. Is it not? No, there's nothing. <laughs> you look super happy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, d- d- here, this is my list. I know that some people are like, you should not get Botox. It makes your skin so smooth. It makes your face look so smooth. It, here, is, here is why I went back to it. Um, I spend so much time looking at myself on video. You have to. If you have my kind of career, You the, the way to reach people is through video. The other thing is that's the way to improve. I take 
full body video of myself up there on stage when I go up to these shows in Austin. Nobody knows me. Um, I am the only clean comic. The only, uh, like, I actually think I'm the only clean comic in Austin. You've seen Austin comedy. I oh, mean, yeah. I think I think I literally am, right? Unless you specifically ask him to come on and do a right. Clean set, oh yeah, but I mean people. Clean yeah, unless unless I'm like, I'll, I'll literally kick you off the sh- off my show. <laughs> yeah. uh, September 13th, Austin. We're doing the showcase show. I make them keep it clean. I'm on the show too. Get your tickets capcitycomedy.com or at my website jfcomedytour.com. Uh, yeah, come out to my Austin show. That'll be fun. But but uh, but I mean, in terms of Here people Austin, who that's yeah. what they do, like, yeah. And Austin is known. Austin, so L.A. and New York, obviously, those are big comedy cities. My city, Austin. Th- my city is the alt comedy city, and by alt, I mean filthy. And so I I will often be the only woman on a ten person show. And um, I'm always 100% of the time, if it is not a show that I am running, it is a filthy show. I mean, these guys talking about every manner of degeneracy (laughs) you can possibly imagine, many illegal things. And I I mean, I I like these guys. They're nice, but it's it's hit or miss to get these crowds with me given that I'm that I do clean comedy female all that and um so I video it and then I go home and I watch the video and so many times it's like the camera adds 10 pounds the camera adds 50 pounds like are you kidding me like how do I look so bad and and the stage lights are terrible because it's some guy who just smoked a lot of weed set up the stage lights and they're like way too bright and so you look horrible you look like a fat vampire I mean everybody does <laughs> no matter what your ethnicity no matter what your weight you look like a fat vampire <laughs> under these stage lights and so this is how I I justify I, I'm getting Botox because I it's not in every endeavor that you go for whether it's your traditional career or a hobby or whatever there is one part of it that you say, that's the hard thing. That's the thing that I get so blocked on that I might not be able to see this through actually because it's that hard for me and I get that blocked. And there are some things like that that you can outsource. If if it's bookkeeping, for example, you could hire a bookkeeper. But there are things... And I guarantee you, in whatever your blue flame or career or hobby or whatever is, I guarantee you, you have something like I have with comedy, like reviewing my comedy footage. I can't outsource it. I have to be the one to look at this footage. That would be worse if I outsourced it and someone was yeah. like, oh, yeah, you bomb so hard. <laughs> you look just so chunky. You know, your weight is really fine in person. But, um, you know, have you considered anorexia? Because I mean, like you're looking horrible <laughs> in these videos. And um, yeah, you just came across as really unfunny. Nobody liked you. Yeah, so it's like you that you wouldn't even want to. Um, you wouldn't even want to outsource that. So I guarantee you, as you build whatever it is that you are going for, you have something like that. You have the thing, and it's the worst thing about it. <laughs> and it's the thing that you might spend years avoiding I know people who have been in comedy 10 years and they won't they just they won't watch video of themselves they won't do it what's interesting is it's all men it's oh, yeah. uh, women are actually oddly enough more likely to to get over the hump and do it so um wasn't that an eloquent way to justify me getting Botox <laughs> that <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> see I Has cloaked it <laughs> I cloaked it in you know making it sound like I'm making a profound point but um but that that was how I justified getting Botox. I was like, it's it it's 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 a deeply unpleasant thing to watch all sorts of ill filmed video of yourself. It can really it can be a hit on the old self esteem. <laughs> and I thought, you know what? I'm just I, I I really I like the smoothing effect of Botox. So right now my face is very frozen, <laughs> as you will see yeah. when you search for Jen Fulweiler podcast on YouTube. <laughs> I should find a URL at some point. Oh, it's also in the show notes. (laughs) Um, My face is very frozen right now. But 
Botox wears off. That's a lot of people don't know. It is temporary. It only lasts a few months. Um, so and it and it's a gradual wearing off. So by the time I hit the road for my fall tour, where I'm going to New York, Pittsburgh, Las Vegas, DC, Philly, Boston, Dallas, San Antonio, Salt Lake City, Ponte Vedra Beach, Orlando, and Atlanta. So far, we might add cities. JFComedyTour.com. By the time I hit the road for the tour, I think everything it'll be just right. A little smooth. But not completely, you know. I'm I'm just I'm just a mannequin with a moving mouth. It won't be <laughs> like that. And I think I'm filming my next comedy special this fall, so that will be good. That will be good for me to have a little. Yeah, we're applauding there for the movement in my face. Yeah. Face. Um, <laughs> not the but yeah, but but this was a. I always tell you guys to take massive action, and I did. I found a new person. This doctor is she she's like an hour away from me. And as I was driving down there, I thought this might be a mistake. I can make my face look horrible. I can waste the money. I might not like this new doctor. But I was like massive action. I'm, I'm just I just I want to <laughs> I, I, I want to be happy with how my skin looks in footage. So there you go. Take massive action. OK, this is our intro topic that leads into that main topic of seeing your kids as your uh, squad. I'm so excited i have the best clip you've ever seen um we'll get to that in a second i need to set this up (laughs) are you familiar with the npc trend on tiktok if not it's so good that you listen to this podcast because i make you hip I, i make you aware of these great things the npc trend on tiktok is it's it's way more delightful to me than it should be. Yeah. So, here, how do you, okay? Let's play a video again. Link in the show notes to YouTube. We are about what's the mark here? We're we're at about twenty six, twenty seven minutes in. So you can skip if you want to pull this up on YouTube. You can see this video. So people on TikTok are pretending to be video game characters, and they go live. And the people watching will tell them to do little things and they do it like they are a video game character. So this and there's one gal who's really famous for it. Her name is oh, I want to give her credit. I'll I'll look up her credit while we play this. Her name is escaping me. Um, She's blonde, beautiful. So, okay, play the first one, Caitlin. Again, you can look this up on YouTube. Go about 20 minutes in, uh, 27 minutes in. It is worth seeing this video. Mm-hmm. To it, you, This is a visual thing. You really want to see this one, but you get a little bit from the audio. Uh, Caitlin, go ahead and play it. Mmm, ice cream so good. Thank you, Jackie. Gang, 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 gang. Oh, special. Gang, gang. What you are hearing, and turn it down just. Gang, 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 gang. Balloon. What you are hearing. Gang, 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 gang. Mmm, that was good. Lemonade. He ha, yes. You got me feeling like so a cowgirl. So people are telling you know this gal. He ha, yes. You got me feeling like a cowgirl. You know to you know to, to make certain slay sounds like a video slay game character slay would. Mmm, ice cream so good. And gang, then. Gang, gang. gang. And then she'll do it. Now, here is, okay, Pinky Doll is her name. Pinky Doll is the name that she goes by. Here's the key thing to know about it. In order to make these requests, people pay. So they'll pay 50 cents. They'll pay a dollar. And you can pay more. Turn turn her audio down just a little more. And you can pay more to have her, I, I don't know, do, like, reference certain things. So... She makes seven thousand dollars a day doing this. Did you know that, Caitlin? I'm about to be an NPC. Yeah, yeah I was going to say, <laughs> Caitlin. Caitlin, is it? She's not even going to finish this podcast I go. episode. I know. So the rest of the episode, it'll be like, be like, hang on, guys, I gotta hit the sound effect. Caitlin had to leave. She's on TikTok, actually, being an NPC. Me. And so it's so easy. That's what you do. You're like, hello, yes, I cowgirl. Cowgirl. And that's all you say. You don't even have to show your feet and you're making $7,000 a day. This Because we were talking about, you know, should we rule out the feet only fans? <laughs> Look, <laughs> hey, before you judge, I got six kids. I got a kid going to college. Like we need money. Yeah. Um, 
I, I've told you before that my that my Yale man husband, who is an economist, when he heard that people made six hundred thousand dollars a year from doing like just showing their feet on OnlyFans, he was like, "How do you set up an OnlyFans?" I'm an economist. He he seriously <laughs> called one of his buddies from Yale. This guy, he's a real estate developer. This friend of his is like multi millionaire, good friend of ours, incredible guy. Joe's like, I, "Should we?" I mean, feet pics. Like, is this? I mean, but all we have to do. Yeah, and then, and my daughter overheard this because speaking of being kind of informal with your kids, my teen daughter was like, "Yeah, you could call it Joe's toes." <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, so, um, but this is even better because you don't have to do any of that. I, Caitlin's, I see the wheel. Yep. She's like, because even if you made half of that, let's see, <laughs> let's say you didn't get to pinky doll level, but you only no, made thirty five hundred a day. <laughs> a day what else would i do oh the goodness. tiktok <laughs> algorithm has been killing me it was wild i got a hundred thousand followers in four months and then it's like two followers since then <laughs> so maybe you guys listen i might burn this whole thing down okay <laughs> we're starting forget over. youtube <laughs> yeah caitlin and i have just been working so hard to pull this studio together i've told you my next comedy hour my next special honestly i am so proud of it I have been working so hard. I cannot wait for you to see it. I honestly, it, it's just great. It just is. There's, I mean, and I and I earned it. It took me two years to get there. It, it you know, I wasn't just like, oh, I just thought of this off the top of my head. Off. I've been working so hard. <laughs> but I might burn all that down. I'll go be an NPC on TikTok. And people will say, you know, Jen used to update her podcast every Wednesday. There was always an episode out. And I joined the Village Hustle Patreon where where she did get ready with me videos where she shared business insights. And I and then when you join the Village Hustle level, you also get the the after party content that was so good. And and it was weird. It was like in August of 2023 she just stopped all that. She's disappeared. Um, and now she's got the NPC millions. She was going for the comedy millions. And now her and her producer, Caitlin, they sit around on TikTok <laughs> and they're like, I like balloons. I like candy. And you guys will be like, man, Jen Fulweiler fell so far. Marty. This is sad. And I'll be like, oh, is it sad? Because I just got my Maserati. Yeah, right. Is it? <laughs> is it? Is it, is it? Is it? Yeah, we'll do it from Caitlin's going to have a BMW. I'll have a Maserati. We will do our little NPC stuff from the car. You'll see yeah. the Maserati logo on the back of my seat as I'm like, I like candy. <laughs> candy pop, 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 pop. And, and, and you guys will judge. You'll judge. You'll be like, wow, Jen seemed to really have a career there. It seemed like things were going well. Her fall 2023 maternal instinct tour. It's weird that she didn't show up for any of those shows because she was making $7,000 a day as an NPC Holy on cow. TikTok Live. Now, this whole, and this is how it relates to parenthood. I'm ultimately leading into a point that, guys, we don't live in your grandpa's era anymore okay the wisdom that you inherited from your forefathers or forebearers <laughs> to be more inclusive to the to your female relatives the wisdom that you inherited from them was back when starvation was a real issue you might have great grandparents or grandparents who lived through the great depression where people truly, they were hungry. It was eight o'clock PM and they had had no food because there was not any, and there was no way to get any, and there was no electricity and they used outhouses. And when you are raising kids in that kind of environment, or if you lived through that, you have certain ideas about raising kids that, that, are, that are great and that are very mm -hmm. efficacious if that is the society you live in. We now live in a society where people are pretending to be NPCs on TikTok <laughs> Live and making $7,000 a day. It's time to revamp our parenting strategies. Now, I am about to play for you the funniest video <laughs> you've ever seen. If you think I'm exaggerating, I, I'm, I'm really not doing this to get two more views on my YouTube, <laughs> but you really should. Jen Fulweiler podcast. I don't know. Or <laughs> click the link in the show notes. Now, what, what's it, what's our timestamp here? We're about 34 minutes in. So mm -hmm. if you switch over to YouTube, you can skip ahead unless you just want to stare at this beautiful studio and be like, wow, <laughs> Jen's forehead isn't moving. She's got a curtain in the background that really does not 
fit with their skin tone at all. Um, skip to about 34, 35 minutes in. You have to see this video. So let me set this up. A young man, he's trying to get his money, which I totally respect. Again, Caitlin and I, yep. you're going to see us gonna, on TikTok. We're, we're doing it. Um, so he's trying <laughs> to get in on the NPC trend. He's trying to make money. And his mom walks in the room and sees what he's doing. And she steps into the camera and tries to get him to stop. Now, I found this on, there's a, an account I follow on Instagram, the Hip Hop Ties account. His username is D-R-I-I-I. His D-R-I-I-I is his username. Uh, does that mean Dr. The Third or is it just <laughs> Dre? I don't know. Um, so, but I found this on the Hip Hop Ties account. Caitlin, play the funniest video <laughs> that has ever existed on the internet. And for those who can't switch to YouTube right now, the audio is magnificent Still as well. Funny. I didn't hear audio on the left. Is your, is, is your laptop unmuted? Cause I didn't hear the audio on the last. Mm -hmm. Did you hear it? Uh, no, but it'll come through on the video. When we okay. All right. This is new. We have a new setup. Okay. Yeah. Play the funniest video that has ever been created. Me. But ice cream don't entertain this. He don't need this. He don't need it. He, so he got a Thank job. He got a job. I work. I got a job. His daddy works. He don't have <laughs> this it. type of stuff. Tish. Thanks for the lightning. What are you doing <laughs> to do this? What is you doing this time? No, she's Ooh, calling his dad. Running. She's calling his dad. You still there? <laughs> I'm trying to see if your dad still talk to your daddy. Y'all, let him talk to his dad. She's got his dad on the phone. <laughs> Thanks for the glizzies. Listen, your daddy is talking. What's good, Pops? Hey, what's going on, dude? Thank you for the blessing. No, no, no. Y'all, please just stop. Just stop because for the we trying to get him some help. Please just don't don't keep entertaining. Thank you for the glizzies. Don't entertain this madness. We trying to truly help our son. Yeah. Thank you for the cap off. No, listen to us. I want my whole <laughs> podcast to be... I, I'm just going to play that video every day. Have you seen a better encapsulation for modern parenting. No. I mean, this if, if we need a better example of this ain't your grandpa's parenthood, this ain't dang sure ain't your great <laughs> great grandpa's experience of parenthood. And and okay, so this leads me into the main topic, which is I, I always think of that great phrase, squad goals. You know, squad goals when it comes to your relationship with your children. And this is a little bit controversial. I would guess that probably most people who listen to this podcast do adhere to the philosophy, whether or not you have kids, but when you think of what, what makes raising good kids, they would say, don't be friends with your kids. And and I, I see where that comes from. I validate that that is a... Uh, um, there is some wisdom behind that. And I can't remember if I said this in the setup, but for new listeners, I have six kids. I had six babies in eight years. My oldest is 18. My youngest is 10. And and again, I have to say, they're turning out well. Mm -hmm. I It is important to establish that, not, not to brag or flex or whatever. Trust me, we have been through the ringer in very severe ways. We have had very serious problems and we we have plenty of struggles now but i just have to tell you the kids are turning out great i have a great relationship with them they have great grades their teachers love them um you know my son's going to college and is studying engineering and he's super excited about that they are very close with each other they're very good friends and here's a data point and and again guys we have our problems i'm just saying this because you should not listen to a word of my parenting advice if I, I live in a hell house where people hate each other and ignore each other and th the kids are smoking crack. I mean, th <laughs> you need to know that things are going well in order to listen to anything that I am about to say. But so we live in a 1900 square foot, three bedroom house. We live on the surface of Venus, by which I mean Texas, where it, it's currently 110,000 degrees every day. So we are stuck inside. It is like we're like we're the Mars people who can't leave the biodome. Um, four of my kids are girls. So the four in the middle are girls. So oldest is a boy, four girls in a row, youngest is a boy. And so all the girls basically are teens. The youngest is 12. So let's call that honorary teen. So <laughs> I have five teens in the house. Four of them are girls. We don't fight. Nobody fights. There hasn't been an argument in our house. I can honestly say this. 
in more than a year. Do you do you ever see our like there there aren't uh, mm-hmm. Caitlin's at my house all the time. We, we just don't fight. There aren't there aren't arguments. There were. We've been through it. I'm we've been through it. But um I've I don't I don't if I have gotten in like an argument with my with any of my teen girls it's been more than two years. Maybe two years ago there was something. And it's funny, my oldest son, we have clashed a little more in the past. I can think of a couple times where we raised voices. But even that, that was a year ago. Um, and sometimes we raise voices kind of in jest where I'm like, you're so crazy. Why are you doing this? This makes no sense. But it's not like a Ask fight. Him, it's okay. Yeah, like slamming doors, uh, yelling, things like that. It does not happen. It, it doesn't happen in our house. And again, the kids are doing well. So... Um, <clears throat> So you need to know that setup in order to listen to anything I'm about to say. Now, the 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 correct part about the idea of not being friends with your kids is that you cannot have a totally egalitarian setup in your house, meaning um, we're literally just all friends. We're all the same here. No one person is more in charge than the next. That's horrible leadership. It's horrible leadership. It is a very scary thing to be in any kind of human organization where it is not clear who is in charge. That might be one of the reasons I read all my business books and am ready to take over if any (laughs) Fortune 500 (laughs) CEOs need a sabbatical because human organizations are human organizations and there is a fair amount of overlap between what works in the military, what works in the corporate world, and what works in families. Um, Now, obviously, families are a bit of a different paradigm. You can't fire people from your family. (laughs) You can't um, court-martial them. Yeah. Uh, So, obviously, we, there are, there, there are different setups there. But, there is some some of the psychological basis of what makes a thriving business or a thriving military unit, there is some overlap between what makes uh, a family thrive. There, There is some baseline psychological truth there that just applies universally to any human organization. And um, there are actually really interesting studies on how psychologically difficult it is to be in an organization with bad leadership We've probably all worked a job at some point with a bad boss where the boss was either controlling and or had no vision and or didn't know what they wanted or where this was going. So the boss would be mad at you sometimes, but you were like, why? I didn't know uh, you're mad at me for this thing that you didn't even tell me to do. Like, I didn't know that was the expectation. Or the boss is just kind of, aimless it's like yeah do that thing okay did you do the thing fine and that's the quickest way for a job to feel dead end if you have a boss who has no vision and no goals well yeah it feels like a dead end job even if you have a cool job I knew friends who worked in ad agencies and media companies and and had jobs that seemed very cool on paper but their bosses had no vision and had no leadership. And so it, it actually felt like a dead end job, even though they were working on Madison Avenue in New York City. Whereas I've known people who, a, a friend of mine worked for the, the local Domino's Pizza in high school. She delivered pizzas, but the guy who owned it, he was really hands-on. He was there all the time and he was a great leader. He had a vision. He said, let's not just deliver pizzas pizzas to people in this town, but let's smile at them. Let's make their day better. He was telling stories about how he had, uh, there were a couple elderly people that they had their little routine that every Thursday they would, um, they'd have pizzas delivered there. And he actually, this is a kind of a, it's a sad story, but I, I think it's worth telling because it shows the power of vision. So sometimes this, the owner would go out and he would, he would deliver the pizzas himself just to, to be hands-on and make sure he knew what was going on. And he was chatting with this elderly couple and they had one child who, but that child unfortunately was killed in a car accident when he was, when he was a teenager. And so they, they were a little bit lonely and they weren't very social. They were both kind of introverted. And they said, you know, just get getting our Thursday night pizza. That's our little routine. And we always love it when you guys show up. It's you have the friendliest people. And he actually stayed and chatted. That was his last 
pizza of that round and he stayed and chatted with them and then he would sometimes bring them extra breadsticks or whatever and he conveyed that to his employees that he said look these people this is a big deal to them they're they're in their late 80s and they're a little bit lonely and that this is like a really cool thing when you show up at their door and so let's throw in some extra breadsticks and and uh, one of the employees would like he'd come up with a new joke every time so when he showed up at the elderly couple's house he'd be like okay okay what do you guys think of this one That's so cute. think about that how think about i mean honestly like what when the and if the npc thing doesn't work out <laughs> like if that guy still owns that store i'll deliver I'm pizzas going. for him i mean doesn't that that, <laughs> that sounds, sounds like kind of a cool job i'll yeah. go deliver pizzas for that guy because he has a vision and that's mm-hmm. really cool and like wow i can have an impact delivering pizzas whereas so that was when i was a senior in high school and it was funny just two years later some people from those, I, I knew people who stayed and they were actually still working at that Domino's. They were maybe assistant manager. They felt really inspired. They loved going to work. And that was at that same time where I knew some people a couple of years older than me. They graduated from college, literally working in New York City, the glitz, the glamour, living in Manhattan. And they hated their dead end jobs because they worked for bosses who did not care. They were just like, I don't know, I get this client... This client wants a, a magazine ad, so I don't I don't like that. I don't like that. So I don't know. Come back to me with something that I like. So they're making money. They're living in New York City, and their job sucks because they are working for someone with no vision. This 100% applies to families. Do you have a vision for your family? Think about it. Here's what gets us blocked on creating a vision. This is where, hit that, I'm going to get philosophical again button. We go deep on this podcast. This is a podcast, yeah. like you have to take a nap after you listen <laughs> to this podcast. I listen to other people's podcasts and I'm like, I guess I should do what they do. I pulled up a very popular podcast for an episode that came out a couple weeks ago. They had 417,000 views um, and they... They started out, if you will excuse, if I may indulge in a bit of vulgarity for just a moment, <laughs> they um, they were talking about what they ate for lunch, and one of the gentlemen was like, this, this thing I ate made me fart, <laughs> and the other guy said, like, I know, like, but I fart when I eat this, <laughs> so I skipped ahead a bit, and... Um, Still talking about it? 10 minutes in they were well they'd moved on to, to dinner because this oh, had been okay. lunch so this is actually what they ate for dinner and how that impacted the flatulence level um 417,000 views I I estimate from what I know about the podcast world they make between 10 and 15 thousand dollars per episode just in ad revenue wow. just in ju- that doesn't count the YouTube monetization um I seriously thought I was like, you know, I'm changing my podcast. I'm, that's what I'm going to talk about. I'm going to be like, guys, I had I a sandwich. Sometimes. Yes. <laughs> and here's here's how my bowels are doing. Um, and it's hot. Like, I don't know. So I'm sorry that you need a nap after listening to this podcast. But I just can't. I can't do it any other way. I'm sorry. I would love to do what the other podcasts do. And I just, my brain would actually melt. I just can't. Yeah. Okay. So we're going to hit the, we're going deep button again. All right, here we go. The reason you hesitate, the reason you hesitate to set a vision for for your family and be a leader who is leading your family in a very specific direction is because you live in a culture that is obsessed with personal autonomy. This is just part of the ether of the culture that you, you don't even realize you're accepting this as true, but it's just out there that the way you be a good parent and to lead your kids to a good life is to have them have no obligations to you or to their family at all, ever. You let your kids just be completely autonomous, no strings attached, no obligation. The minute they turn 18, you only have 18 summers with your kids because the second they turn 18, you cannot say one word to them about what they do with their lives Lord knows you could not expect them to have any obligation to take care of you in your old age, to live close to their family, to be near their siblings, to help their siblings when they have kids or whatever. 
because that I mean it the, the way our culture looks at it it would be like get a Dutch doctor in here to euthanize that person <laughs> immediately if they don't have complete personal freedom get some Swedes up in here to just just put this person out of their misery some people in Oregon <laughs> think of all the places <laughs> yeah, right. that are like really pro euthanasia who's oh it's I think it's the the Danish they're like always killing depressed people they're like the Scandinavian they have it all figured out like okay all right well they kill depressed people but all right sorry so I'm sorry I'm, I'll stop being xenophobic and, and get to my point um <laughs> Well, it does kind of make sense that I don't have a lot of views to this podcast. Okay, <laughs> so um, we're, we we think that life is not worth living if you don't have complete autonomy. But think about this: in any other thriving human organization, a great business a great military operation, a great SEAL team, a great team of Green Berets, a great sports team that, that wins and it's just known to be a great place to, to play football or whatever the sport is. Any other thriving organization of human beings, the members do not have complete autonomy. If you play football for the University of Texas, for Texas A&M, for Alabama, whatever. You can't just do whatever you want. I, I, imagine, <laughs> imagine going to Nick Saban and being like, you know what, honestly, uh, Nick, Nikki, um, going to practice today, is it's, it's not my vibe. I'm just feeling more <laughs> like I would like to find myself and do a little bit of backpacking through Europe more so than like doing drills. Um, so I think I'm not going to come to the next two practices. Do you think that you would still play Alabama football <laughs> if you did that? Yeah. Uh, and, and then same thing in, let's take a, a great company. Think of a company that it, it's great. It's a great place to work. They're, they're doing good work. Um, the boss might be a really understanding, cool person, but if you're just like, yeah, I don't want to be part of these zoom calls or come into the office ever mm -hmm. and just you know n not I, I just don't feel like doing what this team is doing well then you're not part of the team anymore in order to have a thriving team the individual members can't have complete autonomy they can't have just do whatever they want all the time and people wonder why their families aren't thriving it's actually a very simple answer for the same reason that a business wouldn't thrive or a SEAL team wouldn't thrive or a football organization wouldn't thrive. If the coach is like, I just don't feel like I can really tell you guys what to do because I want you to follow your bliss, guys, okay? So yeah, if Nick Saban this year for Alabama says, I, I just um, I just want you guys to follow your bliss, honestly. <laughs> I mean, I just don't want to impinge. You. <laughs> you do you. You do you. That's where, that's my vibe, guys. Um, <laughs> maybe some Texas teams could finally beat them. Actually, I hope you listen to this podcast. Nick, consider it. Please. We're tired of losing. Um, so, I mean, if you're wondering why your family isn't thriving, maybe you've been afraid to be a leader because you buy into these dumb cultural ideas that say that that you can't because because that might take away a little bit of your kids autonomy and notice the countries that are most obsessed with personal autonomy they're not known for having thriving family lives at all so this brings us back to this this idea of being friends with your kids. I do agree that that you don't you don't want it to be friends like a pure friendship. Like literally they they are like your buddies that you go out to lunch with. In order for any team to thrive there has to be a leader and there has to as we just established people can't have complete autonomy. The the leader does have expectations of behavior. And of course, it won't be a thriving team if that leader is a tyrant. If that leader uses guilt and manipulation and gets overly emotional and, and is like for a, a football team if it's like well I just 
I, I just don't appreciate the fact that you, you know, did, didn't throw the ball well. It just, it just really, I mean, frankly, that just hurt. It's like, well, that's now a toxic team and they're definitely not going to win. Um, so in order for teams to thrive, they have to have a strong leader who is kind, who is gentle, who is a servant leader. That, that, that term can be kind of laughed at and thrown around, but there's a lot of, I mean, it's, it's actually a great and efficacious um, way to run your business, like the guy who owned that Domino's. That's being a servant leader, that he was a strong leader. Everyone knew what the deal was, what the goals were, what their deliverables were, what was expected of them, and he would absolutely enforce it if they didn't come through on that. But he was a servant leader in the sense that he was out there delivering pizzas too, as it was needed. So leader vibe, but in that, like, I'm willing to get my hands dirty also kind of way. That is how groups of humans thrives in tribes in teams in families um in corporations in military units you have a loving leader who but who is a leader who is a very clear leader and who is a servant leader who is willing to get their hands dirty and has a vision knows where this team is going and says, look, that I do expect you guys to get on board with this vision. And I do expect the team to move towards this vision. And yeah, that might mean that you will make some different choices. That might mean that you will um, n- not just completely be able to flit off and do whatever you want 24-7 because yeah, you, you are part of a team. But now here is where the friendship part comes in. Um, so yes, you have to be a leader. I want to make sure that we establish that. When I say friends, oh yeah, you're the leader of the friends. Um, now, here is why I think that informality is is really good for modern parenting and having a a sub, much more informal relationship with your kids than your grandparents had with their children and your great-grandparents with their children. Um, It is increasingly hard to keep kids on the moral straight and narrow. If you think that by checking your children's phone, you are going to find anything, (laughs) like, it, guys, listen, I have heard the wildest stories about what kids do to send their little messages to do to like, look, whatever your kids want to do on the internet, they will find a way to do by age 12 or 13. I do think you can moderate it a little bit when they're when they're younger. But let me just tell you. I don't care if you're, I didn't give my kids a phone until they were 19, five, they found a way, okay? They were still sending crazy messages. They have friends. Some way, they have friends. <laughs> you, it's, it is such, it's such a losing battle to think, to think that you are going to find anything. I mean, there are things, I got a list from one of my kids one time. There oh, is, no. let's see, there's, there are tons of apps <clears throat> That it looks it looks like a calculator. So when you pull it up, it's it and it works. It's a calculator that works. That's insane. But if you type in a certain code, it opens up. It's a hidden photos file. Oh my goodness. Yep, yep. And there are some that have messaging components. But but again, if if you check someone's phone, you would never. You know. you'd never know. It's just it, the cal- You could you could d- divide things, subtract, add. Yeah, exactly. I kind of want this just for the fun of it. Well, I know. I now I'm like, well, wait a minute. Like that. That's kind of cool. That's where I think um, go. There are. <laughs> right. I mean, there are. Um, I mean, people share racy things in like shared Excel spreadsheets. <laughs> so just okay. I wasn't sure if I was going to admit this, but I, I think I'll go ahead and do it. I um I, I don't really check my kids' phones because I am enough of a techie that I it, it's it's just, I mean honestly if I if I checked my kids' phones and I saw some racy or inappropriate texts just just in their i messages or in Discord like the obvious I would be like you're grounded for being an idiot like I. <laughs> 
Do you know how well I would have hid this when I was your age? I am. Yeah, try again. Like, come on. I am I so. I thought you guys were smarter than this. Like, you just sent a crazy thing on Discord and then left it there. Like, you you didn't you didn't delete that message. You didn't hide it. You sent it on iMessages. Amateur, <laughs> amateur, amateur move. Um. So and uh, so I just. I, it's. I, I I think that what um what can happen when you check check kids' phones and, and I could be wrong. Okay, this one I I will say I could be wrong. If your gut goes a different direction, listen to your gut. But let me just let me just make my case. Um, so you know, someone's phone is their private space. And, and by the way, this depends on age. My my kids don't get phones until about eighth grade. So. I do think this is different if your kid is if your kid needs a phone you know they're on the bus going to school and they're seven eight whatever years old I think that's a little bit of a different story so I'm talking about junior high age and above it's, it's a little different if they're younger um I, I give that we give our kids flip phone they have a flip phone when they're little um okay but when you take someone's phone it, that's really their private space and when you go through it again you ain't gonna find it anything they don't want you to find and you are signaling to them i i don't i don't trust you it feels like a little bit of a of a violation of privacy and i know i know what people say they say well yeah but it's like it's to protect my kids i mean yes i will violate a little privacy to make sure that they are not being russian arms dealers <laughs> on their phones and and to which i say yes i agree if there were a way to actually get the information you're looking for fine check the phone but you ain't never gonna find it <laughs> my kids maybe it's because of my job maybe i seem like i'm someone they can talk to because they know i hang around unhinged degenerates all the time <laughs> the things these kids tell me i mean it's like they they i and obviously if it were something serious obviously i would report that to their parents i mean i wouldn't you know they're not like i i'm you know i'm dealing with some uh with this chechen warlord and you know we've <laughs> we've got some ak-47s coming obviously i would be like I, i'm gonna have to tell your parents that but a lot of times it's like they know a kid at school who did this or whatever um i, I mean the things that they can do these days to to hide what they're into and so i feel like the cost benefit ratio of establishing a mode of of distrust with your kids and then finding nothing unless they're just absolute amateurs is um i feel like it's just not worth it, it and so here here's what i say as a as a countermeasure and this goes back to this idea of seeing your kids as your squad and having a more informal and friendly relationship with them because there are so many ways now infinite ways for your children to go morally off the rails without you knowing about it. I think that it is the highest priority that we have close emotional relationships with our kids. And I think this is a new thing in human history. I think this is brand new. We are in brand new territory that is, there is no precedent for it in human history. To take my grandfather's life, for example, again, I knew him very well. We were very close. We talked all the time about his childhood, and he was born in 1914. So I have this glimpse into life before electricity. He remembers life before cars. He remembers going around in horse-drawn carriages. Wow. So, or remembered, God rest his soul, he passed away. But uh, he lived to age 100, so we got, we got a lot of benefit, actually 101. So we got a lot of uh, benefit, from just knowing what life was uh, like back then. And one of the things that's very clear is keeping your children on the moral straight and narrow back in those days was significantly easier. One, there was no Snapchat. Yeah, <laughs> there was no, there was no, there were no phones. There was no internet. Obviously, there wasn't even electricity. So Certainly, people are people. Like kids tried. Kids went off the rails and, and did that sort of thing. But it was if, if my grandfather lived on a farm in central Texas, nearest neighbor, three or four miles away. He would walk the classic, you know, walk uphill both ways. I mean, he did. He walked 
the long way, miles and miles to get to school. And then he walked home. So first of all, one thing that is clear is that in previous eras, people worked so hard physically every day. The young people, they if they lived on farms, they had farm chores. If they didn't, they probably had jobs. They were probably working in a coal mine. And then walking to school back in the day, it's often parodied, you know, the old generation say, I walk 10 miles, but guys, they literally did, <laughs> like they did. And so one of the things that became clear to me is I think that kids behaved a little better back then because they were tired. Yeah. <laughs> they were. If you had to get up at five in the morning, do all of these farm chores, milk the cows and slop the hogs and do all this moving and having and lifting, you walk four miles to school. You sit in school. The teachers are slapping you with rulers. I mean, school was traumatic. I mean, the teachers would hit you back in the day. And then you walk four miles home in bad weather. Didn't matter the weather. You know, if you lived up north, it was freezing. If you lived down here, here it was Burning. the hot as Hades. <laughs> you walk up, then you do more farm chores. Then you have to do your homework. He did his homework by kerosene lamp in the evening. When could he have messed around? <laughs> when his parents really didn't need to worry that much about him staying on the straight and narrow. The only thing he maybe would have had time to do was like smoke a cigarette with another kid <laughs> after <walk> class. <laughs> and, you know, in terms of like hookups and things like that. I mean, this was literally back in the day. If you messed around with a girl at school, no joke, dead serious. Her dad might literally show up with a <laughs> shotgun. Yeah. So there were incentives not to, <laughs> right, to not mess around. So really think of that landscape. If you are a parent, and your kids are working themselves to the freaking bone from five o'clock in the morning to nine o'clock PM when they finish their homework by kerosene lamp. Honestly, is is the moral aspect of parenting really that hard? I mean, and, and he affirmed that. He was like, It we did, yeah, we kind of did stay on the straight and narrow because we were so tired. We were so freaking tired. There just wasn't a lot of a lot of time for anything else. Now, physical discipline obviously was a bigger deal back then. Parents were much more harsh. They were, you know, they, they enforced uh, discipline on, on a much heavier physical level. And I think there was a reason for, for that as well, because there what this modern medicine didn't exist. Uh, there was, there was no, um, you know, th there was no urgent care or whatever. So if you tell your nine-year-old, don't climb that tree, and your nine-year-old climbs the tree anyway, defies your orders, and then he falls out of the tree, he has a broken bone, you live in a rural area that to even contact the doctor to tell him that there is a problem is it, it would take like two hours to get out into town over where the doctor is. I mean, your kid could get an infection from that broken bone and die. And so, so that was the big parenting issue back then was, you know, if you tell your kid, don't go down to the creek because you know, there are snakes down there and your kid goes down to the creek and gets bitten by a snake there's there's no 911 back in the day like that the kids probably not going to make it like it's a really big deal so you kind of see how parents did get a little harsh physically because look if that's what it takes to to save my kid's life if i tell him not to climb the tree and he climbs the tree and it's like i know cuz i'm the adult this kid could actually die next time this happens and there's there's no doctor there's no you know there there's no 911 I see how mama could get out the spoon and start whacking people to be like, I, said, I really need you to have a very deep visceral reaction <laughs> to my words when I tell you not to do something. So of course that generation sometimes took it too far. I'm not saying they should have been smacking around kids to the level they <laughs> did, but I do see how a little bit of smacking around, I mean, if it literally you know, keeps your children alive. I see how that was more of a priority. And the emotional component, sadly, I think this is sad, was perhaps not as necessary because not only were your kids too freaking tired to get into too much trouble, but here's the other thing. When, when societies were more cohesive, 
just sort of morally and in terms of their worldview. There was a lot of bad things that came with that. There was a lot of uh, disliking foreigners and people who were different. I'm not saying this was some idyllic thing, but but let's say you lived in, in the Catholic ghetto of like Hell's Kitchen in New York in 1900. That's a lot of Catholics, like Irish Catholic immigrants. Um, if you wanted to be a socially acceptable person, you had to at least pretend to be Catholic. Um, I, I think that people back in the day were probably not more religious sincerely than they are now, but you had to play the game if you wanted to function in society. In my grandfather's day in Texas, everyone was was a good Protestant Christian. You could be Baptist or you could be Methodist. It was actually against the law for Catholics to have jobs around here back in the day. And I wish they'd bring that back because I would mm-hmm. like to be chilling. <laughs> you know, see, then we can I get Caitlin to convert. Fast. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, we can just do the feet pics and the NPC yes. things. And I uh, know that sounds amazing. So I'm on board. <laughs> mm-hmm. So that was the other thing is I, from what I understand, talking to my grandfather, his parents didn't really worry like, will my kids be good Christians? Will they go to church? Because it was just like, you are a social pariah. If it was 1920 in rural Texas and you were like, I'm spiritual, but not religious. I don't go to church. You would not have a job. You would not have a date. You you literally probably couldn't go into the local cafe and buy a coffee. I mean, seriously, you would be so ostracized. So your village back in the day did a lot of work, a lot of the heavy lifting to keep your kids on the moral straight and narrow. Your village did a lot of work back in the day. And, and so you see that model of parenting where you're like, um, you see, you see why it worked, where you would say, okay, I, maybe I'm not that close to my kids. I'm dang sure not my kids' friends. I'm hitting them with spoons, you know, when they're climbing trees and going down to the snake river that I told them not to go down to. And I, there, there's no point in having emotional conversations because we're just all trying not to die here. Okay. If I can just get these kids to survive until adulthood, that is honestly the biggest parenting win that I could possibly have. And Here's another really, I think, really interesting thing. This pod has has got to be exhausting for people to listen to. I'm sorry. I don't know how to do another. I swear I'll talk about sandwiches and farting. I I promise. (laughs) Because that's what people want. They don't want this. But, um, okay, I think this is really interesting. Um, I think there was another reason for that. Like, I'm not friends with my kids. I'm not emotionally close to my kids. I think life was harder than we even understand before, like basically before World War II, before modern medicine, before electricity was widespread, before everyone had cars. So let's say pre-World War II. I think we, we just don't understand how hard life was. Um, it was very common for families to lose a child. That was a, that was a very, 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 very normal part of the human experience. Everyone you knew would have lost a child at some point. I mean, that was just how it was. And life was just crushingly difficult. And I think part of this, like, we're going to be stern and enforce rules and 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 have that distance, emotional distance between us and our kids was, I, I just, I, I don't think you could make it if you had a lot of emotions because there was just so much difficulty and so much loss. I mean, it, if, if you were like a 13-year-old walking to school and like your aunt just died um, of the Spanish flu and your other aunt had died of typhoid fever, and you were worried that your younger sibling was going to die of scarlet fever, um, and, and you're literally walking four miles to school and back. It's going to be 103 degrees. You know, There's no sunscreen. Like You're getting sunburned. Your teachers are hitting you with sticks and stuff. I mean, it's really best, honestly, if you shut down your emotions. <laughs> like, don't, don't, don't be emotional. Like, you just, you've just got to survive. And so I think that previous generations were very unemotional and distant with their kids. And I think maybe that's honestly what it took to just get through life because life was very hard. Um, Now we play that, play that NPC to play that video to play. Yeah. Play it again, Caitlin. Now this is Don't entertain this. He don't need compared to what I just told you. This is our life. He he got a job. He got a job. I work. I got a job. His daddy works. He don't have (laughs) this type of stuff. Tish. Thanks for the lightning. What are you doing Ooh. to do this? What is Thanks that? Thanks for the roses. Oh, TikTok, Are you still there? You still there? So I'm trying to see if your dad still talk to your daddy. Y'all, let him talk to his dad, please, please. <laughs> Thanks for the glizzies. Listen, your daddy is talking. What's good, Pops? Compare that. 
Compare that to what I just told you, the <laughs> contrast to my grandfather's life. Too Have I properly it. made the case <laughs> that we need an updated mode yes. of parenting? Let me summarize my thesis here. <laughs> It is becoming clear to me why I don't make millions on this podcast. <laughs> I, I look at other podcasts and I'm like, yeah, mine's really different, actually. Okay, okay, I understand. I exhaust people. This is why. <laughs> okay, all right. I swear, when we'll do a whole episode where Caitlin and I just talk about what we had for lunch. Because I, so, <gasps> okay, yeah, I'm not going to okay. hit that. I'm not going to go on that tangent button. I... We refuse? I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not bitter. I'm glad that people make ten twenty thousand dollars per episode where they talk about what they're eating and how it's impacting their bowels i think it's i'm really happy for them sincerely um and i'm glad i'm making no money you know delivering <laughs> this this kind of deep thinking content okay so um we need to update our our parental paradigm and here's the summary of my thesis and and i'll go into some specific <laughs> examples yeah okay it's it's all becoming clear now <laughs> right as this episode ends, we will go into the after party on Patreon. That's the lowest level, the cheapest level. You get the after party. We will start that patreon.com slash this is Jen to get into the after party um, after each episode. And, and I'll go into it more. But um, so here is here is my case that we need a new paradigm for parenting. Back in the day, in my grandfather's day, the big risk was that your children would die. That was the big risk. And so you you had to do all of your parenting surrounding, we just got to keep these kids alive. That's the big thing. Now, the big risk is that your kids will get into the most morally reprehensible <laughs> cesspool you can possibly imagine, and you will never know. That is the big risk. Mm -hmm. I think that checking phones... And being too quick to take away phones as discipline, I think I'll, I'll probably go into that. Remind me, Caitlin, I might go into that in the after party. Um, I think I might I might go into that topic of my philosophy on taking away phones as punishment because I, I think it, it's very related to this and it matters. Um, what I worry about is that if you if you check your kid's phone, do that little kabuki theater <laughs> useless exercise or like take away their phones too easily just every time you're mad, like give me, give me your phone. Um, I think you turn their phone into their precious like golem. Mm -hmm. The minute they get out of your house, I, I think it sets them up to be phone addicts because you as a parent made it this whole thing of like this, the, the phone is the battleground. And as soon as they get away from you, they can't get enough of that phone because you you turned it into a battleground. You turned it into something that is taken away very easily. Um, you turned it into a space where uh, it's it's a little bit of a game to hide things. I think it is setting them up to be into some pretty bad things in college because now there's a lot of heavy emotion around their phone. There's an us versus them secrecy thing going on. I just don't think it works. Look, if it worked, I would advocate for it. I just don't think it works. I, I've and I and I've never seen it works. And and for what I from what I hear through the grapevine, mm -hmm. from what kids tell me, <laughs> the data is not good. From what I hear <clears throat> of what goes on with the kids whose parents check their phones all the time, let me just tell you this: um, kids, ten thousand eight hundred and forty-two parents, zero. <laughs> from what I'm hearing on the street, I've what never heard like, yeah, you know, that friend of mine, she wanted to say some crazy stuff with her boyfriend, but her mom checks her phone <laughs> so she can't. That's <laughs> never happened. That's never happened Here's in the history of T. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, so how do we how do, how do we do it? I mean, how do we keep our kids from becoming arms dealers with the Russians <laughs> who like send send nudes to their Russian arms dealer <laughs> boyfriend who they're communicating with on some app that looks like a calculator. How do we do it? I think the only way, and I wish there were a better way because this is, it's hard to measure. I think the only way is to be pretty friendly with our kids and to have that kind of informal relationship. And of course, you are still a leader. You are still, you're still the leader. You, you're the head. Um, you are in charge. But 
the vibe you're going for, I believe, is is like you're the head of an elite squad, like a SEAL team. Or my father's rolling over in his grave because he was he was a Green Beret and he's like <laughs> Navy <laughs> SEALs. That's adorable, adorable. There's a little so little cute. cute little yeah. That's nice try, guys. So I'm sorry, I did, Dad. Please don't haunt me for that one. Uh, <laughs> a, a Green Beret team. How about that? Um, when you are on a clandestine mission, I know a fair amount about this because my dad was a Green Beret and then one of my good friends, her husband, is a Green Beret. So when you are on a clandestine mission with a small team, yes, there is a leader and there absolutely has to be and that person does need to be in charge. But that person has put in a lot of work developing this team so that severe discipline methods are not necessary. And that takes time. You can't just throw a team together and be a horrible leader and then one day be like, why can't I be friendly with these guys without, you know, flogging them and court-martialing them for every bad thing they do. In order to have a team where severe discipline is not often necessary because there's a great camaraderie and everyone's on the, the same page, you have to be a great leader for a while. So I will say this, if if you have a tricky dynamic with your kids and it's and there's a lot of tension and there's a lot of fighting, the first thing you need to do, seriously, start reading books on leadership. I'm not even kidding. Or audiobooks if that's your preference. John Maxwell has a bunch of good ones. Read books on leadership. Learn how to be a leader. Oh, oh read read Brian Tracy's goals. And again, audiobook if that's if that's not your thing. Brian Tracy's goals and pay close attention to his section on taking responsibility and ownership and and leadership. So before you make any changes with your kids, you need to start studying leadership like your life depends on it because your kid's not hanging out with Russian arms dealers and you not knowing about it through their fake calculator app does depend on it. So just take six months and be like, you know what, I'll let my, I'll let my relationship continue to be bad with my kid. I mean, like, we'll just put it on autopilot but I'm doing a six, six months leadership course. I'm going to learn how to be a leader and I'll listen to the audiobooks and I'll see what Amazon recommends. Six months from now, I will be a leader. And then once you have six months of being a strong leader under your belt with your kids, then you can start to have this SEAL team camaraderie, meaning you are the leader and that is very clear to everyone. But you you can have this friendly informality with lots of information flow all directions. Because of your good leadership, you have now inspired the people on your team or family in this case, you have now inspired them to get on board with with your vision and what you're doing. And so they kind of naturally fall into line a little bit because you're a great leader and they are inspired by your vision. And so you find that you don't have to do the harsh discipline as much because they just, they, they get it. They see it. They are naturally motivated to make this vision happen because you've been being a great leader for many months now. Um, and that is the kind of friendship with your children that I advocate for. Ironically, it actually starts with you being a really good, really strong leader. And once you do that and you set the vision and you like watch Simon Sinek's talk on YouTube, start with why. Do that with your family. Watch it, it's just a 10 minute video, start with why. So give your family your why. And and don't worry about impinging on their autonomy a little bit. Be like, hey, our family stands for this and we're going this direction and get on board. And and yeah, that means you can't do this or that thing. Like at one point, one of my teens had something in their Instagram bio that I said, you know, look, as you get older, like you can, you can say and do things you want, but I mean, it. I just want you to consider this reflects on our family. And this isn't really what we stand for and what we're about, like that kind of little jokey, jokey thing you said. And I'd like for you to take that down. Be in that, but I gave them the why. Like this, you are part of a team. And, and it wasn't anything terrible. It wasn't like a, the, over the lines or anything. But I just said, you're, you're part of a team. And our family stands for something. And and I know it's a private account. Nobody knows. But, but your friends see it. And the people at school see it. And so as part of our family vision, I, just, I don't want you to seem like you're not part of the team. Because that's not what our team stands for. So... Um, and, and it worked, by the way. It didn't turn into a fight. They were like, yeah, okay, I get it. Um, so all this is to say, I think that the imperative for us as parents is to have a lot of information flow 
and a lot of camaraderie because the battle that we are fighting is not a physical one. We're not as much trying to just keep our kids healthy and alive anymore. Thanks to modern conveniences, that is largely taken care of. The battle we're fighting is that moral, emotional dimension. And if you are being very controlling, if you are being a disciplinarian, if you are, if you, if you are bringing that 1914 model of parenting into the modern world, I think your kids are tearing it up on their calculator app. I think that they are talking to, uh, to you know, to, to uh, Chechen rebels who are, they're probably selling drugs. They're on the dark web and you don't know anything about it because they have like a fake Bible app that if you type in like Psalm uh, 321A6432, that's how it opens up the dark web and they get their meth. Um, the best you can do is to have that kind of information flow so that your kid might come to you and say, you know, I've been dealing meth on the dark web and, <laughs> you know, mom, I'd like to talk to you about that because I feel like now it's like, you know, I'm wanted by Interpol and the FBI <laughs> and yeah, yeah. And so you, our priority is emotional intimacy and heavy information flow. And the way you do that is by being a good leader, um, not doing things that set up the, a, a game where it's like, I, I'm give me your phone, I'm checking your phone, like for no real reason. Because that you're turning it into a game. Your kid's like, okay, now it's a game and I'm gonna win and they are going to win. Um, and just doing everything you can to be, to be a, a, a Green Beret, not SEAL, Green Beret team <laughs> leader. You guys are trying to get through this crazy culture and survive. And so you need to learn how to be a good leader and have a team with a lot of camaraderie and a lot of information flow. But again, that starts with you. It starts with you getting people on board with the vision and inspiring them. And the more you do that, the more you step into your own leadership, the less you'll have to discipline them and have those kind of team damaging, you know, really heavy discipline moments so obviously okay you know what i'll wrap this up this is a lot of deep thought and you guys need a nap hit the hit the <laughs> we need a nap but they need a nap i i'm sorry this podcast is it's so it's so heavy i don't know how to do small talk guys tell you what you guys learn leadership and i will learn how to do small talk <laughs> i i'll get an adderall prescription tell you what guys i will get on adderall and then i can have a normal podcast i'll have a podcast where i'm like oh Sandra. my gosh guys i saw this movie I had popcorn at the movie. I, I'll get on Adderall and we'll stop doing this. Mm -hmm. But obviously I could go on the subject. I will at the after party on Patreon. Patreon.com slash this is Jen. That first lower level, you get the after party. Then of course there is the village hustle level as well where you get more stuff too. The after party starts right now and we'll talk about the subject more. But basically be friends with your kids. But in a Green Beret team leader way we'll go into this more later but be thinking about it join the after party and i will be back with you next week here on the jen full show